Ooh. All right, it's been a long time since I did a proper color grading video, so let's get going. This video is sponsored by Film Convert. I'll talk a little more about them later in the video. Before we dive into grading, let's first start with some essential and fun color theory. Good color grading starts with a selection of colors before shooting. This is called research on a color palette, basically. If either the cinematographer, director, or set designer messes up in this department, color grading the footage will result in a rather unpleasant experience. The magic happens when you combine the right colors. Movies often work with complementary colors, which means colors that stand opposite from one another on the color wheel. This may sound difficult, so let's pull up some examples. The reason complementary colors work so good together is because they create the highest color contrast possible. In particular scenarios, you want things to pop, so working with a color palette that supports that goal is essential. Another important color scheme that works great for film is a monochromatic color scheme. A monochromatic color scheme consists of one base color separated in multiple shades of that color. Let's take a look at another example. My favorite film of all times, Dune. Now, you can see that all these images are shot using a monochromatic color palette in mind. So it's shot with that in mind. Now, if we do a fast forward scroll downwards, you can see that some images like this one just pops. The reason is because they've introduced a complementary color. Okay, enough theoretical stuff. I'll try to apply all the above mentioned notes in the coming part of the video. So stick around. Let's have a quick sneak peek on some of the images that we're going to discuss. The feeling we wanted to bring across was intimate and soft. For that reason, I chose to shoot on the Leica R lenses and use the longer focal lengths for the majority of the shoot to get that intimate feeling. A little word from today's sponsor, Film Convert. Film Convert is by far the most advanced plugin for emulating film stock. It is so good, in fact, that after I started using it, I haven't looped back. Just apply the plugin to a node in Resolve or an adjustment layer in Final Cut or Premiere, select your preferred film stock, tweak it a little bit, and you're good to go. Now we haven't even talked about the real film grain tool. Now stick around a little longer as I used Film Convert on this project as well. By clicking on the link in the description, you'll get a sweet 10% off, money which you can now use to get a nice tasty coffee. Score. Also, you'll support this channel a lot, so uh, thanks for considering. All right guys, the moment you've all been waiting for, color grading, yes. That's creepy. Let's start with the breakdown of the first sequence. So we're talking about the no tree, why I made particular choices and how I did it. Next, we're talking about shot composition and why this is so important for this project. And of course, we're talking about color and color palettes. All right, the first thing is the no tree. And this is pretty much the same no tree that I use in the entire project. The reason for this is because it is super fast. I make one no tree, I copy it over, and then I adjust every node uh, if I need to. If I don't need to, it saves me time. And if I need to add stuff, I add stuff. But this is basically how I always color grade. All right, so let's put all the notes away. Well, not away, but like let's deselect all the notes. That's the right word. And then let's add them in one by one. So what I always do from start to finish is I add in my CST first. This is because I want a good reference of what I'm doing. So I go from Black Magic Generation 5 film to Rec 709. All right, so this is my preferred color space to work in because this is also how I'm exporting it eventually. Next, I add in my exposure node. And this I always do while watching the scopes, all right? So I'm checking what I'm doing and how the image looks after I added in the exposure changes. The exposure changes are done in the primary wheels using the lift gamma gain offset controls, all right? So just the sliders underneath. That's something that I'm always doing and it gives me great results. Next up is the contrast. I just add in a little bit of contrast. This is just like 1.15. 
Um, you can see that it makes a lot of difference. It creates a little bit more of a, a moody look, which I personally like. I think it's my style, but uh, who knows? <laughs> Next, we've got two white balance nodes. I don't know why I made a separate node for this one. Sometimes I do weird stuff, but this one could easily be done on the white balance node, but for some reason I didn't. Anyway, this just adds in a little bit of, of like warmth, like a little bit of green, and it pops out the, the, the reds a little more. All right, and if I add in this one, you can see that the whole image becomes a little bit warmer, a little bit, a little bit, bit, bit a little bit warmer, right? You can see that in the scopes as well. So the blues are pulled down a little bit and um, we create a little bit more of a white balance reference here. All right. Next up, we've got a parallel mixer, these two. And this is basically where I start to tweak the colors. All right. So this first one is just done in the log wheels. So here I add in a little bit of blue in the shadows and a little bit of reds or warmth in the highlights. And then I play around with the high and low range. All right. I'll go over more detail um, about the high and low range when I get to the skin tone section. Uh, so uh, let's wait for that. Next up, we've got the color warper. This is a tool that I absolutely started to love. Um, it's a really minimal, minimal change, but it adds to the overall look of the image, of course. Something that I always try to do is I try to create a grade with all the knowledge I already possess, have, better word. Um, if I've done the grade and I'm happy, I always take some time to try and and practice with new tools. All right, so this Warper wasn't in Resolve for a long time, so I started using it after it came out. So, you know, after a while, I started to get familiar with it and just the insane control you have over all the colors in your frame is ridiculous. Like you can change every little nook and cranny of the image. Um, based on the use in the image. So what I suggest you do is you create a node tree as you would normally do. And after you've created that node tree and your colors look nice, you just deselect some of the color nodes that you did and then play around with new tools in order to get better at new and creative ways that Resolve is having or, you know, creating for us. That way you're always learning and you, you get better because you get a better understanding of the program and of the skill. <laughs> a lot of hand movement. All right, next up we've got the skin tones. This is a, a way of selecting skin tones that I'm always doing. So what I do here is I create one node and this is my qualifier node, all right? So go to my qualifier, I press Shift H and then I select a color. In this case, skin. So I just click the skin here and that is uh, it. Then I add in colors that I also want, all right? So when I done that, so now I kept clicking, all right? So I click here, I kept clicking, it keeps on adding. But if I want to add colors separately, I can just add in colors with this little add button, all right? So this little add dropper, I can then click on colors that I want to select as well, all right? Now, if I want to, well, of course, get rid of particular colors and I can do it that way as well, but that's pretty obvious. Next, we've got the feather tool. If I want, for example, to feather little edges here, I can do that by holding down the click button and then going over patches that I want added in the frame, but really softly, all right? This is a tool I rarely use, to be honest. What I do use a lot is the matte finesse options. So I go nuts on the clean blacks, clean whites, blur it out a little bit. So, you know, all the edges are softer. So the, the change in color is not so obvious. And um, once I've done that and I've got a clean selection, I then add a new node and I add this blue box to the other blue box or like the triangle. What it does is it copies over all the data, all the, the, the qualifying data that I've added here to this node. Why do you want to do this? Well, it gives me a lot more control because I can now add in all the color changes on one node while still being able to change the whole selection on my previous node without having every, every color added in. If I would do it on one node, I could never undo this. All right, so that's why I always use this, this two node um, structure, basically. All right, 
So um, one little extra tip. Let's copy this so I can put it back. If you add a node and you click, you know, you connect it with this alpha and your image starts to look like this, it cancels out the colors that you um, that you qualified. That's not what you want. So what you do then is you go to your key section, you click on this little button and everything is swapped around exactly how you want it. All right. So what I did here is I went to my log wheels yep, and then I pushed in a lot of oranges. The reason for this is because you have a lot of control over the high ranges and the low ranges of your image, right? So the luminance levels of your image with these two sliders. So I push in a lot of orange and I could also push in a little bit of blue. And then by increasing or decreasing this slider, I can choose exactly how much of that orange is added in my frame. All right. So you can see the, the whole like scope shifting as I increase the low range, All right? So now it's super orange and now it is pulled nicely toward a middle ground. All right, same goes for the high range. If I up it all the way, it is super orangey. And if I lower it down all the way, everything get pulled, gets pulled out. So this way you have a lot of control over what kind of color you want added in what part of the image. Does that make sense? Hopefully it is. Uh, if not, let me know. All right. Now, if you want to get away from this window again, just click this little highlight button or shift H and you're Xing out on it. So um, next we've got our film convert tool, right? So this is where I add in my film print emulation. Now for quick reference, how I would normally do it before I started using film convert is I would make two nodes. On one node, I would add a new color space transform and then go from rec 709 to Airy Log C, all right, because a film print emulation is working from a log based image. And then here I would add, oh, here I would add in a LUT, then go to film looks, and this is built in into Resolve D55, for example, and that's how we do it. Now, this is of course way too intense, so I would compound it and then go to my key section and then lower the key output. This way, is how I was used to do it. Well, because of course, Film Convert is extremely um, like flexible and it gives me a lot more control over how I would want the image to look, All right? So Film Convert has a lot of extra tools that I'm not using here, which I will go over into a separate video, a full fledged tutorial on Film Convert later. But for now, I'm only going to use the film settings and the grain settings. All right, so the film settings is basically a bunch of film looks, all right? So we've got, uh, you know, I don't know, just a lot. Kodak Portra, very popular, uh, you know, just a bunch of these. But the one that I really like to use is the Kodak 5, uh, 5207 Vision 3. And then the cool thing here is that I have full control over the film chroma, so the output of the LUT itself the film look itself, the film, film print emulation, and then also over the luminance levels. So what it does to the luminance value of the image. All right. Now you can also change on what it was shot at. So a super 35 or full frame. To me right now, it doesn't really make a difference. I need to look into this more of what it, it is doing. So I can't really tell, you know, honesty rules. Um, then we've got the crane settings and this is where Film Convert blows any other um, uh, plug in out of the water because right here you've got grain settings and you can just you know put more grain into the, the shadow area uh, take it out of the highlights and I don't know it is just so intuitive on how they work this out you know and um, I haven't really seen such an easy way to work with grain in other plugins basically even the the, the grain plugin from Resolve itself is not as as easy to use as this film convert plugin is. So if you want to play around with film grain, this plugin is the best, absolutely. And of course, you've got a lot of control over every other parameter in this whole in this whole pro uh, plugin. So yeah, it is a great tool. You can export your LUT, blah, blah, blah. But you can also do that, of course, here. So that doesn't really make a difference. But of course, you know, it is overall really nice to use um, and I really like it, especially for the film grain and the film settings. All right. So um, that is basically it. That is everything I do 
for this project. And of course, as I mentioned before, all the, the, the clips have the same note structure, but are adjusted individually to get where I want it to go. All right. Something that you see here in the first sequence where they are scouting birds is that I always try to block the frame. So I wanted an intimate feeling. And in order to get that, you want to try and get depth. All right. The way to get depth is to block the frame with something in front. So here I use the bush. Right here, I use the kid's face. Right here, I use the binoculars. You know, right here, I used his face. So that way you create a lot of interest and you draw the viewer toward a specific point. Um, because, of course, his face is not in focus, but her face is. All right. So that way I, I, I try to put emphasis on a particular object. All right. Same thing happens here. Um, you know, we, we, we have this light in front, which is, of course, a very highlighted thingy. And then the focus is on the book. So you're, you're sort of drawn toward that area. This is, you know, the, the beauty of composition. Um, really quickly back to this area because otherwise we'll uh, go back and forth. Um, the colors are, of course, important here. She used a red hairband and also some red in his uh, jacket, which helped to separate them from the back and the foreground. Um, that really worked well because otherwise, if they, for example, would wear green, um, they would blend in too much with everything around it. Right. So using, again, a complementary color is extremely important if you want to create separation. On the other hand, here, this whole image leans more toward a monochromatic color palette because every color is sort of situated in the same kind of um, color palette. <laughs> I think Resolve even has a color palette generator. Uh, color. Let's see. Ah, color palette. Boom. Yeah. So right here you can see that all the colors are basically in a monochromatic color palette. Yeah. So this is exactly what I showed you before in the color wheel thingy. Now, if we would do the same on this one, for example, let's add the note. Alt S and edit. You can see that we got a green and a red one, a green and a red one. These colors are, of course, quite pastel y, but still they are opposite from one another on the color wheel. Not a straight line, but more a little bit crooked, but still they come close to opposite. You know, so oh, that's a really cool way to check what your uh, image is looking like. All right. Sweet. All right, next up, we've got this shot. This is, of course, a little bit wider. You see the kid, the father. They do research in the book to find out what kind of bird it is or something. Um, and, of course, the main key here is the light. This was a real oil light. It got hot as hell, really. It, like, you couldn't touch it, so it was pretty sketchy. But the quality of light that this light is producing is wow, insane. It's so nice. It's so warm. It's so soft. You know, so yeah, that you can really see that. And that really creates a nice, warm, intimate feeling they have in this tent. All right. Um, these two shots are also part of this sequence. You can see that it's a lot darker here. Right here, it is a lot lighter, as you can see in the water here. But that's why we didn't have a wide shot of this tent. But, you know, you could see that we're in a tent. But we couldn't really fake it anymore <laughs> because this was shot in the, or in the early morning. Um, anyway. The shots here are, of course, the same. Yeah, frame is blocked. Oh, I'm pointing to the screen, which you cannot see, but the frame is blocked by his hand, focuses on the girl. Um, well, this is a, a more overall shot, a more total shot, so you, so you can see what they're doing. But here, of course, same thing, blocked, focus. Blocked, focus. All right, cool. So the two shots here are, are working great because they have uh, a color palette that is complementary. All right, let's add in that little note again. So Alt S and then Command V because I copy it. Uh, you can see that darker blue, lighter, darker blue, lighter, lighter blue, and then a little bit of a pastel orangey look. Yep, same thing here. If you edit in, you can see it very light orange and then bluish. So nice complementary contrast is created here. 
Let's move on to the sequence where they are older, right? So this is uh, in the present day. This was shot in 1990, as they say it. Um, right here, the daughter grew up, the father grew up, got a little grayer. Um, they're doing the same thing, you know, scouting birds and uh, having a good old time, uh, you know, family time. It's important. Anyway, her drawing skills uh, got a little worse, I guess. Or this was the father, of course. Anyway, well, I'll let you be the judge of that. Um, same thing happened here, all right? So we were uh, shooting this in the evening. So you can imagine it was a long day, early morning, late evening. Um, so they're sitting here nicely. Same thing happened, yeah. So I'm blocking the frame, focuses on the on the monoculars and the, the book. Uh, this is a nice wider shot. And then here, blocking the frame, focuses on the book, blocking the frame focuses on dead. This way you create a lot of interest. So this composition is something that I really like to do, as you can see. But of course, framing out and, and, and showing a more total view of what they're doing is also important. Same thing what, what, what happened here is I used a longer lens in order to isolate them a little bit more and then create more interest because the rest of it is nice and shallow. And you know, the ground here is nice and shallow and the water is, is, is abstract. Cool. Anyway, so color-wise, same thing happened. They used a newer version of the light, an LED light, which you definitely can see in the col in the quality of the light, in my opinion. Um, but overall, the whole structure is the same. Same no tree, different tweaks here and there, but the same rules applied to the previous clips. Here, this clip in particular was done with the light up a little bit, so it hits the eye. Basically, how I pursued this, it was just they were doing their thing, just, you know, laughing, having a good old time. And I was just shooting around it. So really hands on and running gun. Then the next sequence, one of the last sequences of this breakdown is the night sequence. Something that I really like to do is because we didn't have the tools to light this whole scene, you know, create a nice soft fill light. I worked with hard silhouettes. I always like to do that because it creates a lot of interest in, in, in an abstract shot because you don't really see exactly what is happening, but you your imagination takes over and that is fun. All right, so here I'm focusing toward the dad and then the next shot is of the dad reading a book and then a nice close up of his face reading the book. Of course, the light in this shot is positioned a little bit differently than in this shot to create a nice shadow on his face. Um, but that, yeah, that's all like things that you need to keep in mind while shooting. All right. So, um, yeah, a little bit more silhouettes here and there. More silhouettes. Well, not necessarily because I'm now shooting from uh, a higher angle so you can see her face, but a nice super heavy contrast look. A nice smile here. So uh, here she zips, zips the tent and uh, they go to bed. After this, a really fast sequence is, is sort of coming with a lot of shots from what we've shot before. Um, but uh, you can see that in the end of the video. So if you're interested, stick around. Um, all right, so a little bit extra on the color palette here. Um, of course, this is a super obvious uh, monochromatic color palette. It is all in the same range, all one color and then different shades of that color. Yeah, same um, goes for this one, right? A little bit moodier, a little darker. Um, so it's nice to play around with these. You know, if you want to create a more peaceful or soft image, a monochromatic palette really works. If you really want an exciting or, you know, like an image that draws the attention a lot more, a complementary color palette works better in that case. So it's nice to experiment with that and also just to try it out to see what happens and to see what your um, feeling says when looking to an image. You know, go to a shot deck, for example, and scroll through thousands of these um, of these sh shots and, and, and see what your feeling says or, you know, wants to say about an image, man. I don't know what I'm saying anymore, but you get the point. You just have to accept your feeling about a particular shot and see what kind of color palette they used. Alrighty, cool. Okay, so that is it for the breakdown. Um, very clear, very simple. It is one node tree, 
uh, it's pretty much one or two kinds of compositions that I used, a, a wider total shot or a nice frame blocking shot. And then for the color palette, we, we switched between a monochromatic color palette and a uh, complementary color palette. So that's that. As you can see, color grading is a lot of fun, but it becomes even more fun when you discuss everything with the people on set, rather before you get on set because this will ultimately result in the best result possible because everybody is on the same page. And I've witnessed a lot of times that I was hired as a colorist and had to do a job that was just undoable. They wanted to have sort of a color palette without having the colors in the frame. I'm sure if you've done some color grading jobs, you are definitely familiar with this case because some people have just no clue what they're asking of people you know, that work in the field. So yeah. If you're a director or anyone that you know produces a shoot, make sure you discuss everything with the people on set. Color palette, the clothing, the lights, everything. That's it for this video. Hopefully you liked it. If you're watching until this point, I can assume you did. I had fun shooting this video, so hopefully you had fun watching it. That would be a win-win. Wow. Now, go get yourself a nice coffee. I'm sure I'm gonna do it because right now, it's 10.26 in the morning, so it's time for coffee. Ze zeggen dat je eerste wandeling voelt als liefde op het eerste gezicht. Vijfentwintig jaar geleden ontmoet ik de grote liefde van mijn vader, de natuur. Pap, je nam me mee op avontuur en leerde mij de natuur ontdekken, lezen en begrijpen. De wandelingen die we maakten, de avonturen die we beleefden, het werd ons leven. En onze gedeelde liefde. De liefde voor frisse lucht, regen, zonneschijn en het zien van een nieuwe maan. Inmiddels ben ik een doorgewinterde natuurliefhebber. En hoewel we Nederland op ons duimpje kennen, ontdekken we nog altijd nieuwe dingen. Nieuwe dieren, nieuw water, nieuw groen. Zijn. Net als vroeger, jij maakt het ons thuis. En hoewel ik inmiddels weet dat ik van spinazie geen spierballen krijg en we niet kunnen wonen in onze tent, kan ik mij soms weer heel even voelen zoals vroeger. Want zolang de wind blijft waaien, het water blijft kabbelen en de maan blijft schijnen, trek ik erop uit en denk ik aan toen. Mijn jeugd en onze gedeelde liefde voor de natuur. Dankjewel pap. Het maakt mij tot wie ik nu ben.